This time on Watchers of Tomorrow, silent but deadly? Hello everyone, welcome to Watchers of Tomorrow, the sci-fi review critique show that's putting the humanities back into science fiction. My name is Gabwin and I am joined as always by my friend and co-host Dr. Izix. Hi! And this week we saw probably the best episode, surprisingly. Holy smokes! Yeah, it was actually pretty good. <laughs> it was good, like it was, it was, it had some normal original series Star Trek-y misogynist bullshit. Yeah, we've seen so much of that at this point, it's kind of, like, hard to comment on it more. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's worth pointing out, because it's there. But, like, without that bit, that was actually weirdly isolated. And then everything else was, it it set up a conflict, it commented on that conflict in, in like, an interesting way that reflected some social dynamics that you can learn from, and then resolved it later. It, it was weird. They, they like, had, had a metaphor that went the entire way through the episode and was internally consistent. And, like, Kirk is actually, like, trying to, like, make the system less terrible for people, too, which is nice. Yeah, Kirk is trying to change the system for the better. Yes, as opposed to just keeping it as is. So this episode is called The Cloud Minders. So minders, like, mind your own business, cloud people. And this was written by uh, Margaret Arman, who also wrote Game Masters of Triskelion and the Paradise Syndrome. So I had no hope going into this episode. <laughs> but then, surprise! As we know, like Paradise Syndrome is probably on the like far bad scale. Mm-hmm. Game Masters is more in the middle. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> At least compared to you know other episodes. There are just way too many guest stars in this episode, so I'm only going to do, like, the top three. Yeah, that's what I would do, too, so. There's, like, two other named characters that I did research for before I wrote the rest of the episode, and then when I was watching, I was like, both of these people have half a line. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm kind of here. Okay, moving on. <laughs> the first guest star is Jeffrey Corey playing Plasus. Plasus. He was actually fascinating. Is it because of uh, he was in Babylon 5? Was he? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was a longtime friend and former acting teacher of Leonard Nimoy, which is how he kind of got involved in the Star Trek stuff. Oh, nice. He was blacklisted in the 50s for having attended a Communist Party meeting in the like 30s, despite then later serving in the Navy throughout all of World War II. So... Yeah, they're really reaching there, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So he actually stood up to and made fun of the American Unactivities Committee, got blacklisted in the 50s, used that and his industry contacts to become the most influential acting teacher of that time period, because he'd already been a well-respected character actor through the 40s. And then in the 60s, he was able to return to acting with all of these new contacts that he made by being the most influential acting teacher of a generation. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, like his, his uh, credits like end in 51 and then pick up again in 1960. And then, you know, he keep, keeps going and has been going, you know, forward, uh, you know, almost every year, it looks like, uh, you know, until uh, li- uh, like 2000. So, yep. Yeah, which he's passed away now, but yeah. So as you said, he was in Babylon 5, he's also been in Outer Limits, played a lot of movie roles in the 60s, he was in True Grit and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. He's been a a character on a few random shows, uh, you know, like a regular, but uh, usually a lot of, like, uh, you know, sort of one-shot guest appearances. And actually did do pretty good acting in this episode, even though he's playing, like, the main villain. So in some ways, he's sort of like the opposite of... What he was blacklisted for. Huh. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I also have Dina Erwig, who played Droxine. Droxine? Ro- Roxanne, but but with diroxalness. Droxan. <laughs> this was one of her earliest acting roles. Uh, she was on other shows like around and after this. Mission Impossible, FBI, The Usual. 
candidates there. Washington behind closed doors. She was in like six episodes, looks like. Oh. That was her last role from what I was able to find. Yeah, she kind of dropped off. A lot of the random guest stars on this kind of drop off eventually. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting that they kind of disappear out of nowhere there. I think that's kind of normal for a lot of actors from this period, but, you know. And then, finally, we've got Charlene Pollitt as and, Vanna. Uh, she has a very, very short uh, credit list overall. Yeah, she was basically doing community theater acting. Uh, got her first film role in around, like... 68 this was her like first ever tv appearance on star trek here uh she later went on to guest star in a few shows like hawaii 50 and things but uh, i think went back to just community acting but she was pretty good all the same so uh yeah she has passed away but uh yeah good yeah good stuff going so we may as well jump in there's some actual commentary and things in this episode yeah, let's go. Let's These roll. episodes are so easy to write when stuff happens in a coherent order that makes logical sense. It's great. It's like, there, there's story beats and plot. Holy crap. There's another plague. Whoops. Uh, space plagues are like the thing, I guess. This is like, like three yeah. or four episodes in a row now. <laughs> it's like, oh, one person has a plague. Now everybody has a plague. Now this entire planet has a plague. It, now all the, the, the plant life on this planet has a plague. Yeah, which I did think was weird, because generally we call a plant plague a blight. Yes. But they keep saying the plague, so. Well, well maybe it's like a plague of locusts. That could They're just be. Re- really bad at describing it. <laughs> that would explain why they need another mineral. What is it with needing minerals to cure diseases? I don't know. <laughs> the only thing I can realistically think of is, like, lithium can treat bipolar disorder, but that's not a plague. Well, I guess this is not necessarily just an element, but like some sort of special compound that's only found in the one place here. But, you know, it's still kind of the same thing. Yeah, it's weird. So the Enterprise is trying to save all plant life on a distant planet. And the only cure is Xenite, which is a mineral that can only be found on this one planet, Ardana. Well, it's a good thing that they're part of the Federation, then. They arrive, and the High Advisor wishes to receive them on the cloud city of Stratos, which is supposed to be great and pretty and awesome. But Kirk's in a hurry and decides that they need to skip the honors and diplomacy and just go straight to the mines to get their minerals. Oh, kind of makes sense. They're on a ticking... They, got a, they already set up the ticking clock, so, yeah, let's just keep going. So Kirk and Spock beam down to the mine entrance, and there is no Xenite. They do spend a bit looking at the cloud city, which is up actually floating on a cloud. Go it's figure. Kind of pretty. Yeah. They are soon ambushed by several men in work clothes and one woman wearing blue work clothes. This is Vanna. Uh, Vanna, by the way, is is wearing makeup. So just so you know that she's different, I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. These are the troglites. Okay, then. <laughs> I didn't put it in the thing. They later go on to like actually fully explain that troglite is an abbreviation of troglodyte, which means cave dweller. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, they're very subtle. Subtle writing. Yeah. <laughs> Too subtle, apparently, for audiences of the time, since they had to explain it later. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. They are the mine workers of this planet, like, exclusively. Kirk tries to explain their emergency situation, but they will not hear it and soon have the two overpowered. Just then, three figures appear on the transporter platform. The older man, Plasus, and two guards, who are armed with better weapons, and manage to scare the troglites off. So, um, I, I guess there is some sort of uh, dispute here, and, uh, and now we're going to have to like negotiate uh, you know, some sort of workers' agreement. As Plasus explains, there's a small group of troglites called the Disruptors, who have been making things difficult and don't agree with the natural order. Um, what? That doesn't sound... yeah. But they've got the situation under control, and if they join him on Stratos as his guest, they will soon get all of the stuff they came for. Alright, let's go check out the Stratosphere place. Uh, Stratos is a place of luxury and refinement, with art being its primary export. Once yeah. there, Kirk and Spock are introduced to Plasus's daughter, Droxine. As he says, speaking of art, uh, 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 uh look at uh, how hot uh, my daughter is, right? Yeah, she, she's barely wearing any clothes, huh? Isn't that great? Yeah, and this is her dad. Yeah, it's a little creepy. <laughs> During the tour, they find a dagger-like thing that's one of the troglite mining tools defacing a piece of art. I thought it was part of the piece of art, actually. Yeah, me too. 
Flasus complains that even art means nothing to these inferior beings, and as so soon as he sends Kirk and Spock off to their quarters to rest, the guards drag the nearest troglite in for questioning. Well, uh, just maybe this guy was up for defacing some art. Uh, are you guys going to like be reasonable here? Because you guys have been saying some things I'm not trusting real much here. They interrogate the man who continuously claims that he's just there to administer some repair work, but after some more questioning and the threat of being strapped to something called the rostrum, the man jumps off the side of the balcony. Well, whatever that rostrum is, I, I hope it was better than, you know, falling 30,000 feet to your death. Yeah. So Spock voiceovers all of his concerns about this stratified society with the wealthy living in literal clouds above the others. <laughs> blind this, to the conditions of those below and uh it, it's sort of like hmm so audience this is what you should be concerned about <laughs> fyi yeah this is the only real criticism that i had of the episode apart from the blatant obvious horrible sexism is they did not trust you to understand this metaphor yes <laughs> <laughs> this stratified society while we're hanging out in the stratosphere <laughs> It's not just a clever pun. <laughs> Spock hears Droxen making drinks in the next room and goes to have a chat with her. She is very hot for Spock and his Vulcan ears and logic and eyes and whatever. She's yeah. she's just obsessed with Spock this time. Kirk does not get the girl. Yeah, so uh yeah, there's a a a aspect of character creation in the game GURPS called uh, z a xenophiliac. <laughs> I think she's I think she has that. Kirk, who's now alone in their room, is soon attacked by Vana, dressed in the clothes of the Stratus City this time. She oh, no. gets to, like, wander around now. Cool. She tries to stab him, as all women should. Yeah. Uh, she is then easily overpowered in a really creepy way. He even comments on how he likes it. Because you gotta yeah. get that extra sexism in there. It's like, Kirk, I, you, you've won the fight. You don't need to be a creeper on top of it. Come on. He lets her up to talk and answer some questions, but then she immediately starts attacking him again, because why would you trust this guy? Yeah. In the next room, Doxine and Spock are discussing the finer points of Vulcan mating when Kirk calls them in to help. Yeah, so as I said, she's really into you know, like Spock. As well. Yeah, yes, actually, we both said that, really. But yeah, so she really wants to know how the, the Vulcans are, uh, you know, how they get busy and how often. Mm -hmm. she's probably disappointed there's more struggling there's some argument on the purpose of why the enterprise is there since vana sees it as an intimidation tactic and roxanne is confused why the troglites would be so unhappy since they like mining and would hate to be in a place like this where there's art and stuff um Droxine, uh are are you are you for real like seriously <laughs> The guards take Vana away and strap her to a stone pillar sort of thing. Is this that uh, creepy, uh, yeah, crazy uh, uh, torture device that the guy was wanting to uh, commit suicide over? Probably. There, Plasis asks her questions, and the stone thingy is actually just causing her pain in between questions, which is great for them, I guess. Kirk and Spock hear her screaming and come to object to the torture, which infuriates Plasis, who demands that they return to the ship and leave the situation to him. Kirk has no choice but to leave because Federation rules, and Plasis orders that he be killed if he returns to the city. Wow. Um, so this planet's a member of the Federation, and... If this is the quality of planet we're letting into the Federation, that's, there's maybe some issues there. Maybe this is why a good half of the episodes of Next Gen were examining Federation candidate planets. Yeah, it's like, we're going to make sure these people are okay, and uh, oh crap, another, another planet that kind of sucks. Kirk is angry, but feels his hands are tied until McCoy shows up, because he's been going over the data about the troglites, and has found that, in fact, the troglites are dumber. 20% dumber. Oh, well, well, however that works. That's awkward. Even though, as Spock points out, they are, in fact, the same species. So there must be something else going on here, because if they're not, like, you know, completely different cre creatures here, but they're the same pe people, what's up? As soon as you feel like this is going down the same eugenics -y rant that other episodes have... Yeah. So this this did not feel like it was going to a good place. Mm -hmm. we, we were watching this. We go, no, no, McCoy, no, stop. What are you doing? Stop doing this. Oh. 
So then McCoy reveals that he's found a previously unknown environmental factor, namely that the Xenite in its raw form releases a undetectable gas that, after sufficient exposure, negatively affects the mental abilities of humanoids. So basically everyone that works the mines is being slowly poisoned. Yeah, just uh, anyone who feels like watching this episode, they use some like older at the time scientific terms that strike you as pretty bad now, yeah, which is why crass, I'm you could say avoiding it. <laughs> this spurs Kirk into action. McCoy pulls out the standard Federation filter masks that protect from airborne contaminants. Yeah, the perfect thing for any time you'd want to go somewhere with fill, filled with toxic gas. Yeah, so we've, we've had so many plagues, now we got masks. It's, li it's like someone planned this. <laughs> it's like, everyone keeps dying for stupid reasons. Let's, like, try to fix some of this crap, eh? Mm -hmm. Kirk tries to talk Plasis into letting them give them the masks for the troglites so they can be protected from the detrimental effects of the mines. But, of course, Plasis will hear no such thing. Troglites are just inferior, and there's nothing more to it. So he he basically thinks that there's they're just lying about the whole gas thing. Kirk decides that he needs to do something about this himself against regulations and orders. So Kirk beams down to Vana's cell, uh, intending to convince her that the gas exists and that the masks will be able to help her people. She reluctantly agrees because she doesn't really have much of a choice at this point. And Kirk stuns the guard, who's bringing her food so that they can escape. Uh, once they're down in the mines, however, she has him attacked and steals his weapon, intending to keep him as a hostage so that they will have their demands met. Well, um, she, I guess I can sort of excuse her sort of uh, turnabout here uh, because, you know, Kirk was really creepy to her earlier, mm -hmm. but it is still kind of like, hmm, I guess this kind of is just going to complicate things now. Well, she also thinks that the gas is a ruse. Yes. Because, you know, they've lived this on this planet their entire lives for, you know, generations upon generations. And, uh, you know, no one's detected this gas ever until today, apparently. Which is weird. Yeah. Eh, you know, I guess they just never thought about thinking about their environment, I guess, to a certain point. Shrug? Kirk overpowers her again, then uses the phaser to trap them in a part of the mine by causing a rock fall, which now he's blocked them off from oxygen good job well uh, you hope you have enough in there to uh, resolve the plot he calls spock and tells him to beam plasis down to the mine with them without prior warning um so that's kidnapping right yep scotty prepares to beam plasis down but they are kind of stopped because he's talking to droxan and they are too close together to be able to beam out safely droxan is concerned with how they're treating the troglites and is starting to question their way of life because you know strangers have come and told her that something's wrong here yeah so 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 maybe my perfect life where everything was you know dictated to be as this maybe it's not as you know you know sunshine and rainbows as i thought here so uh so dad you seem to be kind of invested in all this what do you think about this mm, Plasis is like what did kirk tell you this stay away from him and she's like no spock's the hot one he's like oh ha 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 you like spock go away <laughs> you and your weird fetishization of alien beings. So she is told to go because too many questions. This gives Scotty a chance to beam him back down to the mine, where he is quite angry. Well, you did just dismiss your daughter for trying to think for herself, so mm -hmm. screw you, guy. <laughs> and even though he's upset, Kirk has the gun. Yeah. So he orders both of him and Vana to dig until the gas kicks in and they can see what he's warning them about. Uh, quite some time later, their oxygen's really low. Kirk is looking really agitated, and so is Plasis. They get more and more angry and agitated and argue with each other until Plasis challenges Kirk to a knife fight. As you do. Kirk throws his phaser aside and goes, I can kill you just the same, and then they begin to fight. Vanna suddenly realizes that they are fighting because the gas has gotten to them and goes, oh my god, the gas, but now they're too far gone. She does manage to get a communicator and tells Spock to beam them out of the mine. Plasis tries to attack once again on the ship, but this time Kirk knocks him out pretty easily. Yes. <laughs> well, Kirk now has oxygen again, so he's not uh, he's not suffering a handicap, so mm -hmm. his, his power level increased to full again, so, you know. So back on Stratus, everything's fine now. Vanna's delivered the Xenite, all the troglites have been given all the masks they need to counteract the effects of the gas, and they have a promise that they are now all going to share the planet and the city. Oh, that's good. So we, we actually, like, kind of fixed something, and 
They're going to be hopefully moving forward with a better society going forward. Plasis is still angry and wants to press charges on Kirk, but as Vana points out, this would mean Kirk would have to come back, which yes. is enough to convince him to not do that. <laughs> Damn it, you're right. Just go away, Kirk. I never want to see you again. Spock says goodbye to Doxane, who now wants to leave the city and go see the rest of this horrible, horrible desert planet they seem to live above. Yeah, it's... The way they sort of set up the the planet is that you know it's you know red rock everywhere, and you know, when they're up in the city, you can look down at some stock footage sort of thing going on, uh, as far as like the the endless flats and wastes and things like that out there, and uh, and yeah, it seems kind of desolate and unfriendly. Yeah. So now that all there's everything's fixed and all the goodbyes are said, Kirk and Spock beam up to go save this other planet that they were trying to save the whole time yep uh with like a couple hours to go before it all everything there dies so you know the end hopefully they make it in time yeah the the kind of key features of this planet that got half explained or glossed over is that the surface seems to be almost entirely unlivable so everyone either lives in this cloud city place or below ground in the mines nowhere in between one questions where they get their food but I'm going to guess that they don't need food. <laughs> they live off their the power of smugness. Yeah. Or they um, eat mushrooms. Exclusively mushrooms. Oh, yeah, it's like uh, the, the game series of Varanum. Have you ever played those? Nope. Okay. It, it involves uh, people that, that uh, get exiled to an underground cave system where they oh. eat mushrooms. Okay. <laughs> sure, why not? Anywho... <laughs> So this one has some, like, actual stuff that we could talk about. So, like, uh, you know, stratifi- uh, stra- stratified uh, societies, uh, power dynamics, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, basically a de facto enslavement of entire classes of people uh, that are put in environments that are harmful to their health and uh, uh, kept away from education and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, where should we get it? <laughs> What I thought was the most interesting with the way that they set up this episode, especially with how badly they've done some of this in the past, mm-hmm. was that it, it was set up as a stratified society. And as far as you know, there is some kind of physical difference between these people because they've set that up before. They even st- start talking about it later. Mm-hmm. And they're like, no, actually, there's environmental factors that are having an actual impact on people. It's not just like, no, there's no difference at all and it's arbitrary. It's like, no, some of the stuff that they're talking about actually does exist and is measurable. It's just not existing for the reasons they say it is. Yeah, so they're they're right about their observations, wrong about the causes. So it's the same, it's a very, very real-world metaphor because the conditions that you keep someone in are having a deleterious effect on their ability to function and live. And then that itself is used as a justification for why they deserve to be kept in bad conditions. So if you're in a situation where you, you know, are, are, don't have much money, you can't really move anywhere else, and you uh, don't also have you know, meaningful uh, you know, employment that you can actually, like, make more than just the bare minimum to survive, things might kind of suck for you. Yeah, the amount of extra work that people need to do to, like, elevate their status in society the way that we think of it in America, that you can always, you know, change your social level because we don't actually have class stratification in America, is an impossible amount. Because we keep on having things like, well, you can just go to college or you can do extra work and we have college loans and things. There's no barrier for people. But if you already have to spend literally all your time just trying to survive and having all your resources taken away from you, it is an unsurmountable amount of things you have to do. And, uh, you know, th- things like the, you know, you know, the college loans there are things that will keep certain people from even getting into the system and will ensure those that do are unable to move up to the next level uh, because they're spending all this time and money uh, trying to pay out back these loans. It's almost unimaginable from like, this is something that I've had to come to terms with 
over the course of my life and learn that growing up as like someone in the you know middle upper middle class area in the suburbs of the u.s the amount of extra stuff that we put on to people in the lower tiers of our society to have to do the amount of extra costs that it incurs the amount of extra work that you need to do in order to just achieve a normal survivable amount of living is so much greater like if you took all those extra costs away basically everyone living below the poverty line would suddenly be elevated to middle class because it's not just a fact that you're making less or the job you're doing is respected less. There are actual monetary and physical punishments that are given to you because you don't have enough money. Like being poor costs a lot of money in this country. Just enough to keep you there and then some. There's all the things that you, anything that you need to live, you can't just buy a version of it and have it you have to like rent it or have extra charges for it or these loans the predatory payday loan industry is something that people have talked a lot about recently and there were going to be some regulations on it that have sort of gone through in some places but not really and just just like all the things that we incur on people for them to be able to live at all there's no actual options i actually just learned this and it struck me as pretty macabre because of the way that this just functions is there's not really an option for people to freely have funerals or like get rid of a loved one's body yeah if someone dies it's illegal to keep their corpse around of course but you're responsible for paying to get rid of it so if you don't got the money well um you, you got to find the money otherwise you're gonna get fined or you know put in jail because you're keeping a corpse around yeah, in some places there are like state options. If you just can't afford it, you can tell the state that you can't afford it, but then they just take the body and you never see it again, which you don't want to do with, you know, someone you cared about. Yeah, and it's it's it might be used for, you know, uh, science, it might be, you know, sent off to a uh, like a you know, teaching hospital or something like that, or you know, it could be sent off to uh, test uh, body armor, you know, for like, you know, uh, military applications. You never know. It just Suddenly their body's gone forever. Now, basically, these ones are always cremated and or buried in the, like, state pauper grave funeral. But you never get to see them again. It's not like, yeah, we'll take it and bury it, and here's where they're buried, or here's a headstone, or here's where the funeral's going to be. It's just like, okay, gone now. Yep. Which isn't particularly apropos for the episode. It just struck me. I learned this the other day. It's like, well, that's just incredibly crummy that we do that to people. You know, I remember uh, my mom uh, passed away uh, about 12 years ago now. Uh, she, uh, you know, was cremated, but, you know, even up until that, you know, there was still lots of, you know, costs associated with having a funeral and all that. But if we cut out all that stuff, just to get cremated costs like a few thousand dollars. It was kind of crazy. Yeah, I think the cheapest that I have heard quoted is something like $900, which is a lot of money for someone who's living who's living below the poverty line and not doing well. Most people don't have access to that. So it's you you have to find some other option or alternatively go passively into debt well, because because your your loved ones uh, passed away. And if you're poor, you probably don't have life insurance to sort of cover these kind of costs as well. This is the like thing that the episode is commenting on weirdly well for this series that the social stratification is enforced by the fact of the social stratification. So yeah, how it's been set up is, you know, is keeping it rigid. They can look at it and go like, well, these people just don't have the same skills or knowledge base that the rest of us do. They must be inferior, but they don't have the same skills or knowledge base because they haven't had the opportunity to get them or they've been physically held back from getting them. Or even in a thing like this, something that actively hinders their abilities like um, there's been a lot of talk recently about how communities of color in the u.s have a much much higher than average exposure to lead in their drinking yep. water yeah so uh, remember flint michigan mm -hmm. their water still is terrible which has massively harmful effects on people especially children mm -hmm. often prevents them from living like a 
full normal life if you're exposed to too much lead as a child. It impedes your mental development massively. And so if you're sort of exposed to that from the day you were born until, you know, you die, that's basically an entire lifetime that's been, you know, held back because of this environmental factor. But we don't want to do anything about it. So. Because it costs money, man. And we, we can't spend money on making people's lives not terrible, I guess. Mm hmm. Ugh. But as many people right. have pointed out, as you just did, like Flint, Michigan still has not had its water fixed or reinstated. But and, the and estimated it, cost for that is only a few hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, and it's just not happening. There is, there is more than enough money in the government. The United States government spends trillions of dollars on things in general, which is, you know, more than billions, which is more than millions, which is more than a hundred thousand. Yeah, this would cost under a billion dollars, and billion dollars is basically the baseline for pocket change for the U.S. government. Yes, it's it's. This is the kind of thing where you you know, you, you you can, if you need to move money from something to someone some, somewhere else, you just forget to hire a couple guys for a couple of years somewhere in the government, and all that money can get put to fixing this, and that's it. But anyway, we yeah. haven't. I feel like I'm repeating myself a little bit, and I want to apologize, because this episode does make some good points, and I've been fighting a migraine all day, which makes it difficult to actually coherently Perfect. talk about yeah. them. So yeah, You're doing so fine so far. <laughs> I will also say that there's things, you know, so, so like the Flint, Michigan water problem, that's not a one-off thing either. There are lots of cities across the U.S. that have water uh, quality that is at or worse than that but the the you know, the, the powers that be the, you know the city governments the state governments the, the federal government just aren't really interested in ever addressing it so yeah <laughs> and surprise surprise a lot of these places tend to be inner cities uh, uh or impoverished communities uh that you know maybe if they had the uh, you know the economic uh, might to take care of this, this themselves maybe they would have been able to do it by now but they do need outside help, and until that comes, that's you know, they're going to be sort of stuck in this situation perpetually. It really kind of sucks. And uh, there's also you know other sort of I guess uh, 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 pollution sort of related uh, you know aspects that come in because uh, there's been you know over the years a number of instances of um, industries being sort of pushed into certain communities that happen to be very pollution heavy uh, industries, but because the communities are impoverished, uh, that they are are unable to basically say not in my backyard. And so the whole, uh, you know, you know, the NIMBY uh, sort of uh, slogan, uh, you know, keeps, you know, the, the, the wealthy upper class neighborhoods far away from in the, the massive factories while the, you know, the, all the pollution gets put into the, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the lower class neighborhoods, minority neighborhoods, uh, and, uh, you know, you know, sort of related there. And well, suddenly you, your water sucks and you can't breathe on top of that. So, and so, you know, they, you, it's like, you're going to grow up with, with asthma and you got lead poisoning. So, uh, yeah, pull yourself up by your bootstraps if you can, I guess. Ugh. So, yeah. And a lot of this stuff is sort of just sort of glossed over in a lot of, uh, you know, conversations in the U.S. And I'm very happy that more people are taking note of uh, this sort of thing. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, you know, a lot of, you know, activism going on right now on you know, a number of issues. But uh, this is one of the things that I hope people remember in the long term, because this is, this is a long term problem that we need to solve, because otherwise we're just going to be stuck with this rigid stratified society uh, ourselves that has the option to bring in you know your, your breathing masks and solve the problem we're just not doing it which is i guess i don't like to use this term very you know for for for, for very many things but i would say to do nothing is evil <laughs> well keeps striking me in a lot of these things and it's a difficult thing to come to terms with that there are a lot of problems that we have in the U.S. especially, but worldwide also. And they're eminently fixable, and we have the resources to fix them, and we have the ability and technology to fix them. We just decided not to fix them. 
Indeed. And it's pretty difficult to come to terms with that as a citizen of a country with the time and resources to do that. It's something that we need to like be keeping in mind because there is a lot of intermediate stuff convincing people that you can just fix these things easily is a big part of the problem. And getting anyone to like actually do it is a big part of the problem. But once you get there, you can just do it. It's like, you know, not only can we do this, but we should do this. So let's just do it then. <laughs> All right, so one other thing that's a less physical manifestation of this that kind of struck me, because they, they even basically mentioned it in the episode, they didn't use the term, but they said they were able to somehow determine that the troglites were 20% less intelligent than other people, which was odd. Yeah, that was a little weird. So that kind of reminded me of the way that we use IQ testing. Because mm -hmm. IQ is this weird idea. If you actually think about it, even the way that they mentioned in the episode, the whole like 20% less intelligent than on average. But like, what does that even mean? What is a definition of intelligence that's even useful to measure? And how are you supposed to measure it? I don't know. <laughs> uh, throughout my life, I have taken a couple uh, IQ tests like administered by like people that are supposed to be legit for that sort of things. But in retrospect, I kind of wish I hadn't. Because they are kind of bullshit. <laughs> yeah, the because you know, there's so much subjective about it that it's like, okay, we we can we want to measure ha how much this way of thinking can uh, you know uh, work. So we're going to have a puzzle about with some blocks or something like that. Or alternatively, we want we, we value the intelligence of being able to recall facts that people should know at this age. So we're going to go out there and standardize test everyone and put together a, a thing that if you don't remember all these details specifically, then then you you are not as intelligent because we say so. And neither of these is necessarily going to capture anywhere near the totality of someone's intellect. Now, so the IQ test, as we understand it today, was kind of first brought into popularity in the early 1900s. And as we've talked about several times, early 1900s America was bad. Yeah, it kind of sucked. Because we wanted to develop a scientific way to stratify people. That was the basic thing that lots of people in the early 1900s were pushing towards. And the IQ testing was one way to do this. It was actually invented by people who, who were unabashed racists. We need a way in order to separate ourselves from those other people we already have or you know, we already hate. And we want to make it look like we're not just haters. So, here. Yeah, and they, like you said, it's supposed to be sort of a, like, general knowledge exam, which is a weird way to define intelligence as, like, mm -hmm. general knowledge that you should have been exposed to. And, yeah, if you go out and test a bunch of people and say this is the average of what people should know and we call that a hundred and anything above the average is over a hundred anything below the average is under a hundred that's the basic idea um where it starts to really fall apart is with who you're testing because the way that these tests are based is of course they are targeted almost exclusively at like middle and upper class white people mm-hmm and it's been very well demonstrated that people of color do worse on IQ tests, just blanket in a way that doesn't make any sense unless you're trying to prove that there is some sort of like actual mental difference. But that just can't exist. Like the test itself is flawed in a way that no one wants to acknowledge because the test was purposely designed to be flawed because it was yep. made by racists who wanted to prove white supremacy but we keep using it for some reason we've had various versions and we keep trying to refine the stupid thing but since we haven't dealt with the core problems of the racist base and that there isn't really a useful definition of intelligence that we've ever come up with it it keeps being flawed yes uh, and so it just keeps getting you know used as an excuse to justify horrible things and that's it's it's kind of time to retire it yeah it's also weird to use it as an excuse for things because why would you like if even assuming that any of this worked why would you say that someone with lower iq deserves less things shouldn't they deserve more things 
because yeah, they need more help. Beings, yeah. Like, if you want to balance it out, shouldn't people with higher IQ be getting less stuff and less education because they're already starting better? Uh, you know, it's like, okay, you know, if they still want to sort of keep us in school because, you know, we're still, you know, youngsters, then, you know, the, 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 these folks that you've marked as being super intelligent, you know, just let them sort of do their own thing part of the day and then spend more of your time working on, you know, you know working with the folks that do need more help to sort of get back up to speed. Well, that's not how that's, we do things because yeah, you're supposed yeah. to take the, do the whole, I don't know, highest impact junk that people keep wanting to talk about. Or if you help the more intelligent person, they'll like reach even higher places and do more. And it's a more overall good for society to ignore more than half the population. I don't really like feeling like a human resource. Do you? No, not particularly. No. That's how no. we treat people. So, yeah. So, yeah, we, yeah, the the IQ test thing and the way that they talked about the stuff in this episode is like, yeah, there is a reasonable, you know, definition of intelligence that we can use. And then it's just not, you know, telling us the thing we think they're telling us, which is kind of a problem with how we set up these things, because they are sort of implying, unfortunately, that if the gas hadn't existed, then it would have been right that people were being treated this way. Yeah, which it does kind of suck, but uh, you know, I guess it's they had to do something. Otherwise, you know, the process just seems completely ridiculous. Yeah, it just winds up in sort of this trap when you start to try to tell people why you need to care about other people, and saying that it's because we actually are all on the same level. And there's environmental factors that make us not on the same level. But because we're all on the same level, it's okay and we should be helping people. Kind of misses the core point that we should just be helping people. Because then, if you accept that, but then find some other reason or find some other person who's not on the same level, then they don't deserve help anymore. Because we've defined help as something that only people who are on the same level need. And we eliminated the environmental factors as something to consider in that, which was a massive step forward if we did that but it's still missing the key point because then you could say like well this person is physically unable to walk which so are they on the same level or this person has an actual like learning disability or mental health issue or something so they don't get to be on the same level physically and since we only eliminated the environmental factors you wind up with problems there indeed and so you get you you just sort of shift how the discrimination is happening to you know, to to different uh, sort of set of excuses, and it continues just in a different form. Yeah, so I keep saying you can't have a line because as soon as you have a line, all you're doing is arguing about where to put it. So toss out the line and just treat everybody with respect. Now the other thing, despite this episode doing its metaphor very well, you wind up with the same problem that you always get and will probably always get in Star Trek generally, um, and this kind of science fiction narrative which is the reason that the people of this society changed is because this like technologically superior random other dude came in and told them what they were doing wrong. Including how the troglites themselves didn't even believe that there was an environmental factor affecting them until Kirk came in to convince them that this is the thing they needed to change. Yeah, there's a little, uh, you know, sort of... A knight coming in and just sort of showing everybody else what to do, uh, which kind of echoes that whole colonialism thing we've talked about from time to time. And, you know, the whole white man's burden sort of nonsense. And, yeah, it is kind of annoying. Yeah, it's nice that you wanted to treat the natives good this time, but it's still up to Kirk whether or not they get to be treated well. And you run into some other problems just with the history of this show. Because this planet, they all get to be equal because they're all the same species and they're all white people. But if we are on a different planet where that wasn't the case, then yeah. Yeah, if they weren't the same species, would we be having the same discussion? Probably not. Because, yeah, that's how, how sort of things ran, ran for this show. So yeah, I'm not trying to poke holes, but it is very worth looking at where the metaphor fails. Uh, but uh, that, you know, that, but... We can still praise it for at least, you know, getting most of the way there. Yes. Oh, so we do that. <laughs> and then, of course, it has the problem that we've been talking about overall, where there's a character in here who I think was maybe supposed to be 
the naive innocent who just believes all the things that her society has taught her until she starts questioning it and then realizes how crummy the society that she's been brought up to believe in is. Um, they didn't give her that narrative arc. They just made her eye candy for Spock to stare at and by extension, the audience. Yeah, to a certain extent, she is kind of there to sort of ask the questions, but she doesn't really change because, you know, she doesn't give any really satisfactory answers. Yeah, they don't give her an actual character arc. She spends the majority of her time talking about Spock. Every scene, in fact, she spends talking about Spock. And every now and then going, well, Spock said that maybe we treat people badly. <laughs> posh, posh. You know, what does that Vulcan know anything about anything? Vulcans don't know anything. Wait. I thought that's their entire thing. Hmm. Yeah, Droxen's entire character arc in this show is, does she choose her father, who's been her predominant male figure, to tell her what to do? Or does she choose this new guy that she finds attractive's worldview so that he can tell her what to do? And her entire purpose in the story is kind of, is she go which of the two men's viewpoints is she going to be swayed to? Would be nice if she had decided neither and like I don't know, maybe she came up with the whole plan to like give ventilators to people. That would have been cool. It'd be nice if they just either didn't include her at all, if they're not going to do this, or if she was an actual character who was examining the things that her society taught her in light of the new information she keeps finding out about how the society functions. She's supposed to be there to question the things that she's been taught as a younger person in this society, but she's not. She's there to be argued over by the two male influences in her life. It, it was sort of, uh, you know, you know, pointed out, uh, you know, I guess a third of the way in the episode that she and uh, Vanna, the uh, the disru uh, disruptor lady, do have a history together. And so maybe throwing them into the same room at uh, some point where they could just actually just have a conversation would have been, uh, you know, you know, would have been a great uh, sort of alternative to sort of what we did get as far as her lack of art. Now, see, by the end of this, I really wanted them to have had like an underground Romeo and Juliet thing going the whole time. But we're, you know, we're barely getting that now. We weren't getting that in the 60s. Especially in Star Trek. <laughs> hmm. Want to talk about... Uh... United Arab Emirates for a few minutes? Sure. I know almost nothing, so go. <laughs> so the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, actually kind of reminds me of the setup on this, in this, uh, on this planet to a certain degree. Because it has a fairly stratified and controlled economic system in place at this point. Where you got the locals who are kind of in charge of everything. And they're building the big skyscrapers and everything. Then you have a sort of a working class that is actually predominantly foreign born. Uh, they are not citizens. They are basically imported as migrant labor and, you know, uh, set up in the sort of very, very rigid, uh, you know, uh, economic system so that the, those in charge can very quickly and efficiently, uh, you know, adjust the labor pool so that the unemployment rate is always very, very small. And they do this by basically sending people back home or bringing more people back in, depending on what the, the job situation requires. And so they have this sort of funky situation where they can also use this to also, say, prevent anyone from organizing, you know, like labor union or something like that. Uh, or, you know, trying to ask for, you know, better working conditions or to not have to labor in dangerous situations pointlessly for no reason. And, and so it's, it's, it, it did kind of remind me, you know, that this is kind of the same sort of, uh, you know, end dynamic that's happening on, uh, in this episode is happening in the real world in, in the UAE. Um, you know, I've actually, uh, uh met folks that, uh, came to the UAE because their parents were, uh, uh migrant workers. Uh, and it, it's, it's sort of, it's like, Hmm, this all seems familiar. Oh, yeah, that's when I was watching this episode. So just wanted to sort of, you know, mention that that's sort of a thing that does kind of exist. The, 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 the method of control is different, but the end product is still a desert area with cloud-like cities 
where the rich and powerful hang out and everybody else lives in the slums over here. It's almost like the thing we're doing is having science fiction comment on how the real world functions. Indeed. Imagine that. <laughs> so UAE, it's it looks pretty, but there's 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 some some issues. Yeah, be wary of anything that looks pretty. There's a reason that looking pretty is like the hallmark of all dystopian fiction. The giant gleaming towers and everybody suffering down the, on the street level. All right, I think that was all that I had. Same here, really, actually. All right, well, then we might get in under an hour again for this episode because it's time for the galaxy's favorite game show! Hey everybody, welcome back to the game show portion of the show. How's everybody doing today? I hope you're doing fantastic. I'm doing pretty well myself. Our uh, contestants have racked up a number of uh, points here. We got a uh, got some got some points to, prizes to hand out. Um, so Gepin, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Excellent. Good, good, good. Let's start off. Our first uh, you know award prize dealio dealy is the Marks or Bust Revolutionary, which goes to Vanna and the disruptors for basically being tired of the stratified society nonsense. What do they win, Kepwin? They win some Marx books and other political theory because they didn't have a good plan. One thing we actually didn't get to mention in the episode is how they said that all the security forces in the city were actually troglites who were elevated up to the city so you know some solidarity in there would probably overthrow nice. the whole city in a matter of minutes if you wanted yep. <laughs> so uh maybe that's what happened after kirk left who <laughs> Uh, our second victory prize here is the Berserker Button Prize, which goes to Plasius. Because if you dare question the exploitation for which he obviously benefits, you're going to have some trouble with this guy. What does he win, Gepwin? Plasius wins some therapy. Anyone that wedded to not questioning the ways their life is better than others has some very deep-seated personal issues that they're going to need to work out before they're open to change. Indeed. So, perhaps... Perhaps you should get started on that. Hmm. Uh, maybe, maybe her, uh, his daughter uh, will have some character development and show him the way. Our uh, third and final prize for today is the Terrible, terrible Economics Prize, which goes to everybody in Stratos because they're reliant on an extraction-based economic model that exploits lower class via chemical control, which is prone to failure when the inevitable possible outcomes of uh, overcoming the chemical control, drop in demand for extract materials, or running out of extracted materials occurs, and thus dooming their crappy planet and everyone on there to a state of poverty forever. What do they win, Gepwin? I don't actually have a prize for this one because, like, you just described Earth. Oh, crap. Uh, what do we win, then? I don't know. Either change or hopefully a swift and painless end. I I'm, ho I'm, I'm pulling for some change here myself. Uh, but yeah, hmm. Anyway, that's all I got for today. Uh, take us away, Gepwin. As Thank you all for joining us here. Thanks to all our contestants, and we hope to see you next time on the Galaxy's Favorite Game Show! <laughs> Why you gotta keep making the game show depressing? I don't know. <laughs> it's supposed to be the light tie-in to us talking about next week. Well, uh, maybe maybe uh, I can uh, come up with something more humorous for next for next game show. Well, bit. Oh, you will be able to because next time is one that I've I've never gotten to see, but it's one that I've been looking forward to because it seems to be just peak. Star Trek ridiculous. Yeah, because I I, I, I see someone with a stovepipe hat. Yeah, so the next episode is called <laughs> The Savage Curtain. I think the only thing that I or anyone else needed to know about this episode is this description. It says, aliens force Captain Kirk and First Officer Spock to join forces with Abraham Lincoln. Sweet. We're going to go, like, fight the Civil War again, aren't we? Yeah. They fight... Colonel Green, okay, a woman named Zola, and Earth's Genghis Khan. There's also Kaelas. Yeah, just Kaelas, Sirach, K 
Kalos shows up in this? Huh. Apparently. I didn't know Kalos <laughs> was a thing before Next Generation. That's interesting. <laughs> Neither did I. So. <laughs> sure. So, so we're, we're going to have a, 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 a pretty wild time, it sounds like. Yeah, it is just... Aliens want to examine the contrast between good and evil, so... History's greatest heroes and villains, go. <laughs> Wait a moment, uh, Kirk, you're on the wrong side again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right, we're going to have a good close look at all this nonsense, and you can too, next week on Watchers of Tomorrow. Next time on Watchers of Tomorrow, Lincoln versus Kayless, fight! <laughs> have been listening to Watchers of Tomorrow, a podcast on science fiction media. Find and follow Watchers of Tomorrow on Podbean, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, Spreader, Digital Podcast, and perhaps many more to come. If you enjoy our podcast, make sure to subscribe for more, and where possible, make sure to rate your experience or leave us a review. You may find Gepwin on youtube.com slash Gepwin and Twitter at Gepwin. You may find me, Dr. Isix, on youtube.com slash Dr. Isix and Twitter at IsixLP. Music is Waveform and Mori's Principle, both by DRKRN. You can also check out the Watchers of Tomorrow Discord channel. Make sure to share the experience with your friends, family, enemies, and alien overlords. If you feel you are suffering from transporter syndrome, please be aware that the next time you step off the transporter, that you, that is now, no longer exists. <laughs> <laughs>